it's all grace. Um, it was paid forward. Mm -hmm. I'm just stepping into something that already that he'd already done. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really it, it it hasn't it doesn't need a conscious decision to not be egotistical about that. The fact that he already did it um, is in and of itself. It humbles me. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 137 of the Between You and Me podcast. This is a place where we talk to music makers about the things that hurt, heal, and change us in church culture. My name is Jessica Morris. I'm an Australian music journalist, and for the past few years, it has been my absolute privilege and pleasure to chat with some amazing musicians, both upcoming and really established about what it means to be a Christian in the music industry or what it actually means to create good quality music while you have a spirituality or when you're wrestling with it. It means that we have some really interesting conversations because it means we have really interesting conversations because in a divided church, we have so many points of view and so many stories and each one is so valid. What I love about music is that it can bring us together, that we can learn from each other's stories and find empathy for each other. That's my experience with this podcast. It's why I created it. And today we have another example of that. Today we are speaking to, I would say like a country music legend slash he became a Christian music singer. His name is Tim Menzies. Now, Tim Menzies has been creating music for longer than I have been alive this man has got Grammy nominations. He's written for people like Reba McIntyre, Kenny Rogers. He's recorded country albums and he's recorded Christian music albums. And there was actually quite a leap between them. His Christian music came later in life. Um, but this coming week, he's releasing his new album, Christian Country Roots in the Genre, if you can stick them together. And it's called He Reminds Me. Now, Tim is so, so passionate about God. He's passionate about God. He's passionate about crafting great songs. This man is like a consummate mu musician. You will hear that in this. And he's also really passionate about truth-telling. So what was fascinating for me is that in a genre that I know very little about, I'm talking like country roots and even Christian country roots, he really revealed to me a bit more about the culture, the culture of middle America um, and what it looks like to have a deep, profound, active Christian faith in those areas. I can't wait for you to hear from Tim. He tells me about his album, but he also tells me about his story. This guy became a Christian later in life because his kids started going to church. Um, it's quite a fun story and there's a lot to it. Now, a lot has been happening in Christian culture this week. I'm talking particularly about the revivals happening across America and in some other countries around the world. Um, most notable, I guess, would be the Asbury College revival, as it's been called, knowing that that's appeared on the news and all over social media. I do have some thoughts about that. If you would like to hear them, I'll be sharing them after this interview. So hold on for that. In the meantime, we are going to celebrate the life and the story of Tim Menzies. Friends, meet the newest member of the Between You and Me family. This is Tim. You're about to hear a short bio, the who, what, when, where, why, and then we'll get straight into it. Trying to wrap up the career of Tim Menzies under 10 minutes is a challenge. This Grammy-nominated roots and country singer has been in the music industry since he was three. Yes, quite literally. As a third of five children born in Mechanicsville, Virginia, he joined his family band and by the time he was eight, he was touring full-time and playing mandolin. I can't do that at all. We're talking opening for artists like Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton and more. Now, with his intention set on becoming a full-time musician as an adult, Tim moved to Nashville in the 80s and his wealth of experience treated him well. He would join the band Bandana and they were signed to Warner Brothers Records and between 1985 and 87 they experienced success when their tracks charted on the Hot Country Songs charts. Tim actually left the band in 86 and began to pursue solo music and songwriting, often going by the name Tim Menzi. 
and in 89 he penned the hit Mama Knows which was recorded by Shenandoah. Now this caught the attention of Columbia Records and he soon received his own record deal and dropped his debut solo album in 1990. Titled Stone by Stone, it featured tracks like Hometown Advantage and had moderate success on the country charts, peaking at 72. This album was followed in 1992 by This Old Heart, released by Giant Records. And it was actually around this time that Tim became a Christian, but I'll let him tell you that story. Let's just say it changed the way he wrote his music. It took another 10 years for Tim to release his next solo album. It was 2002 and his self-titled album, Tim Menzi, came out. But in the interim, he continued to work rigorously as a songwriter, even having some of his own recorded tracks picked up by artists and having success. For instance, his song She Dreams became a top 10 hit for Mark Chestnut in 94. And if you look back through Tim's discography, you will find artists recording his tracks decades after their release. Over the years, Tim has written for Shelby Lynn, Trisha Yearwood, Kenny Rogers and Reba McIntyre, and he was a mainstay in the country music industry, residing in Nashville throughout the flourishing of the genre and the town's rapid growth. But in 2013, with the expiration of his songwriting contract and the loss of his father, he felt a shift in his career and he stepped towards Christian music. Returning to his birth name of Tim Menzies, he partnered with producer and musician Ben Isaacs of the Isaacs Family Band, and he released the album His Way of Loving Me. This independent release was well recognised and respected. In fact, he received a Grammy nomination for Best Roots Gospel Album that year. And if you want affirmation that you are on the right path, that seems like a pretty good sign. Following on from this, Tim continued to sing, teach and minister at churches across the country and he formed the ministry The Word and Song. He then went on to release the album His Name Is Jesus in 2019. This featured duets with people like The Gay The Vocal Band, Vince Gill, Rhonda Vincent and Karen Peck. This is like the cream of the crop in like Christian slash roots country music. Now here we are in 2023 and Tim Mendes is back and he's about to release his album He Reminds Me on March 3. Featuring the single On My Father's Side, I spoke to Tim about his incredible journey to Christianity, being a Jesus follower as opposed to a nominal Christian, and being obedient to God when he changes your path. Friends, it is my honour to introduce you to Tim Menzies. So, for everyone who has never met you face to face, or who has even just heard about you, who is Tim Menzies in your own words? A Christian a husband and father and musician and songwriter. Yeah. Yep. Nicely done. That's so succinct and perfect. Thank you. Now, you you have achieved, as a musician, you have achieved so much. We were even just talking about how long you've been in Nashville in 42 years. Um, and professionally, your resume is just so impressive. You've worked so hard, um, both as a soloist, you've been in bands, you've co-written, you've seen everything. But I'd love to know where your story actually began in terms of where did your love of music come from that actually sent you on this journey that took you to Nashville initially? Yes. Um, I was uh, birthed by a guitar-playing, singing mother. And so she was singing and playing as a teenager. And then she and my father got married. Um, this was many years ago. She was 15 and he was 17. And they stayed married 61 years. Oh. Um, yeah. So in the beginning of their marriage, my father was very supportive of her playing and singing wherever she could in Richmond, Virginia, in that area. We were from a little town north of there, but all of the music was happening in the city. And um, they eventually had five children, and I was the third one. And as each child um, got old enough to sing and or play an instrument, we joined the band. And so my whole childhood was the family band. Um, and um, we were the local opening act for all of the national people that came through. And back then it was Johnny Cash and like Dolly Parton was Dolly Parton was still with Porter Wagner and Loretta Lynn was with the Wilburn brothers. And, um, I was like four or five and six years old. Wow. And, um, I literally noticed that all of these people that make the music that I loved 
had Tennessee license plates. And so at five or six years old, I figured I need to be in Tennessee. Um, and so the dream was born very, very early. And um, there were a few times in my childhood where I was unrealistic and thought that I could be in the music business and a veterinarian uh, you know, at the same time. The same but veterinarian. Other, I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> other than those few uh, excursions of youth, um, I was pretty singularly focused on getting to Nashville and being in country music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's one thing to have that dream and that passion because we know that lots of lots of people carry that. What were the stepping stones for you to actually get there? Because obviously you were already in a family band. You had seen parts of the music industry. But what did it look like to actually like devote your your life, your, your career and profession to trying to – create your own music and go to Nashville in, in pursuit of that. One benefit of being in the family band was, uh, for the most part, we were always working. We were always playing. I remember I had my my ninth birthday um, at a club, and I don't recommend this, but we played clubs and bars. I mean, it was how I grew up, you know. And it was a different time, but I still don't think it was, you know, the, the best way to do things. But... Um, I had my ninth birthday at a place called the Hideaway Lounge, and we were celebrating my ninth birthday and simultaneously not having a Friday or a Saturday night off in four years. And so as far as the it developing the talent, that was taken care of in the family band, where a lot of people who have that dream also have to find an outlet uh, they have to find a way to develop the talent while they're having their dream. And where I was incredibly blessed was that the talent got pretty developed even while I was still living at home and going to school because I was constantly playing and singing and the family band was constantly singing and playing. So I was kind of ahead on that area, on the development mm -hmm. area musically. Um, my father had a rule that uh, you know, the old, if you live in my house rules. And uh, one of his was, was that we were going to finish graduate high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was kind of a rule follower. And so then my next goal became getting out of high school. And so um, I took extra classes and graduated early oh. and moved to Nashville as quick as I could. Yeah. And so my, I didn't think much past getting here. I was so young. It was just like getting here was the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, then I then faced, you know, um, the, the mountain climb once you're here. Um, but I was so young and eager about it at that time that just just being here was a certain success. You yeah. know? And so and then I didn't uh, I didn't take my other uh, counsel from adults. I didn't have anything else to fall back on. And so um, I can be highly competitive in music uh, and then nothing else. <laughs> so I love I didn't that. Have a, I didn't have anything else to do. And so, um, and the Lord blessed me um, right away when I got here. You know, I started having invitations to play. And so, and being able to sing harmony mm -hmm. uh, and play, got the invitations for live music, which is how you can make a living until you either play on records or have songs recorded that you write. That takes a while because I don't, all these years I haven't seen somebody, I've only seen one or two people in 40 years move to Nashville and be able to compete uh, as a songwriter or a musician as soon as they get here. Um, Obviously, I was never in the NFL, but when I hear athletes describe the difference between college football and the NFL, it's quite a it's quite a leap, and that's what happens when you move here. Yeah. I drop my keys on the way out the door. Turn the corner too fast, turn the coffee over on the dashboard. Just what I need, 
Old man Johnson on his harvester Two miles an hour got a line of traffic Trying to get to work Eight cars ahead of me You know the good Lord's got a plan For every moment of the day Sometimes we're right on time When we're so sure we're running late couldn't see around the corner looking out for what the morning had in store. I dropped my keys on the way out the door. Oh, we will get to your story about how you met Jesus, because that's a wild part of your story too. I love this. Uh, but I'm curious, in these early days in Nashville, you are finding your feet. What did your identity look like? What did it mean to you? Because at this point, you hadn't given your heart to Jesus. And as far as I know, you hadn't yet met your wife. Uh, well, I met her in Virginia. Oh! And, yes, yeah. And um, I knew I was moving here, uh, and she was a singer. Oh, and God. my brother, by that time, the family band had kind of dispersed because some people, some of the siblings got married and some that didn't want to keep working for their dad and that kind of, that kind of natural things. But... Um, so I was working in a, I was I'm traveling on the road, saving up to move to Nashville, because I knew that I would be broke when I got here, and I was where I was right, yeah. And so I was saving up, and I went back to Virginia, and I went to see my brother, and he was playing in her band. And so that would have been March of 1980, and we met, and um, uh, we fell in love, and, and uh, we both, we knew that we would, get married but we also knew that um both of us getting married and moving here together um financially would be difficult mm -hmm. and so i came by myself and um i was here about a year and then we got married um and so that uh she was raised in the church and so looking back i can see now god's plan and what he had in mind that I didn't have any idea about. And her being raised in the church is what eventually led to the faith. But in that beginning, one thing that the Lord did, and I, this was before I had any faith in this following, I was never an atheist, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. No, no, no not at all. And so the music kind of kept me from choosing sinful lifestyles. Not that I didn't sin, but if I did something and it interfered with my ability to play the guitar, then I didn't do it again. Yeah. And so most things that hurt you uh, inhibit your ability for your motor skills yeah. and the ability to play. And so it was one way, without me knowing what was going on, I think it was one way that the Lord was kind of preserving me for my ministry. Uh, that I was so in love with the music that I didn't do things consistently that interfered with that. Yeah. And so I didn't really have, I was never, like I say, I was never an atheist and I never, I never looked around at creation and didn't know that there was a creator. But I was not necessarily seeking his wisdom um, as to what I was, how my life would go. But I was so focused on the music that that, in a way, kept me out of a lot of potential trouble you know, yeah. that I see a lot of people get into when they move here. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So your now wife moves to Nashville with you. You guys get married. What was your journey to starting to not only attend church but go to a cell group, give your life to Jesus? How did that all happen? Yeah, well, we were married in 1982. <laughs> and um you know just normal young struggling and that kind mm -hmm. of thing and then um we did plan our child and he was born in 85 and when he got the toddler around my wife felt compelled to have him in the church the way she was raised and i didn't mind them going but i refused to go um and growing up I only heard negative things about the church. Um, and so I just, my, my impression of it was that I didn't need it, you know. 
And so uh, when he was about five, they came home from church and I was in the kitchen, um, still half asleep, you know, my sleep closing. And uh, he walked up and he's like five. And he said, how come Mammy and Papa go to church, me and her parents, and me and Mama go to church and you don't? And there I was, you know, kind of trapped in my own kitchen by a five-year-old. And my first thought was, you know, he'll think of something else and take off. And I don't have to, you know, just kind of got me trapped here, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't move. And uh, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know a little child will leave them. I didn't know that it was the Lord moving. And he just stood there and stared me down. And uh, my wife was still in the doorway. And I'm looking at both of them, and they're looking at me. And I knew in that moment everything that I was going to tell him as to why I didn't want to go was an excuse. And I knew if I gave him an excuse, that then he was going to want to use that same excuse. Oh, wow. And that that would hurt her. And so it, it was closing in on me, you know. And... I didn't know what else to say. And I said, well, I'm going to start going. And because um, growing up in those bars the way I did, I always detested lying because I saw so much of it. And the Lord knew that. And he knew that if I told my son I was going to go, that I would go whether I wanted to or not. Because uh, <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to go. <laughs> And so, I mean, I was just, just honest. I didn't want to go, yeah. you know. And so, um, as I thought back, because as as you're living an experience, you're not mentally recording it mm -hmm. because you don't understand what's happening until you have hindsight. And so, that was about June of 1991. And uh, the Sedo group, as you say, was a Bible study mm -hmm. that started about in August and my wife came home. And now when I went to the church that first time, uh, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know that's what it was. I just knew there was something that my writing career, my country writing career was going great. I was having a lot of success. Um, but when I walked in that church, I knew that there was something there that I didn't have. And I was very attracted to it. And I wanted more of it, although I couldn't identify what it was. Um, and I know now it was the Holy Spirit in those body of Christ meeting in that church. And so no one had to talk me into going anymore. I was loving it, but I wasn't committed to Christ. And um, my wife came home and said, the church is having a Bible study, and it's that same kitchen. And um, I heard myself say, I want to go to <laughs> And so she was like, why did I say that, you know? Uh, and it ended up being a 34-week study. <laughs> and go through Revelation 22. Revelation! Oh, wow! Extensive. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And, and look at this, Jess, the way the Lord does. I was making a living with stories. Mm -hmm. And so now he starts me out in the Bible at Genesis 1, which is stories. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't like a, a big theological endeavor. I started reading these stories of how God interacts with his people. And before I could mentally defend it or understand it, I knew it was true. Wow. Now, looking back, I know that I knew that in my spirit because I knew it was true and couldn't defend it. But I knew it was true. And the thing that is amazing to me, too, is I didn't join that Bible study to prove God's word or or disprove it or agree or not. I went neutral. I went to the Bible study just because I was already somebody's father and husband mm -hmm. and I've never read it. I had never opened it. And I thought, you know, I should know, you know, what it says if I'm you know, <laughs> be be a full grown man and all. And so um, I just went neutral. And that's all God wanted. Just me to not be against him. Wow. Just fascinating. There's power in those pages, grab a Bible, look it up. You won't find a loophole to water down the blood. That crown of thorns was jagged, the nails pierced in the wood. We can't sugarcoat the story, 
just to make the lost feel good. If that rubs you wrong, take it up with the boss. Cause I ain't sanding off the edges of that old rugged cross. I ain't apologizing for standing on the truth. I won't stand before the Lord with some old lame excuse. I'm marching right behind him. He said, don't count the cost. So I ain't sanding off the edges of that old rugged cross. So all of this happens, you come to a point where you overtly choose Jesus, because I know that you're loving it, but when was the point where you actually went, I believe in God and I'm choosing to follow Jesus? This is another thing that uh, it doesn't follow a doctrinal path yeah. or a denominational path. Um, I started becoming very uncomfortable with my self and my decisions and my worldview. And I didn't understand that there was a transformation beginning. And we were still in the Old Testament. <laughs> I had gotten that stone. And uh, one night after class, and, and I've had to look at all this retrospectively, um, it must have been around September of, because now I know at what month you're in what book by that study. And because we were in Judges, we were uh, still in the Old Testament. And um, after class, I was talking to the teacher in the parking lot. And I said, he noticed that I had been, uh, instead of just filling in the little squares in the manual with notes, I was filling extra notebooks uh, with notes. So just, I would stay up to one or two o'clock in the morning reading and studying it. And uh, I said, I didn't understand, you know, what was happening, but I was very uncomfortable with my worldviews and what I thought about things and everything was changing. And he explained to me that the Lord was transforming my heart. And that would have been about September of 91. And when we got to the New Testament around January, um, it really exploded to me as to what had already happened. That's the thing. Um, now, confessing and professing the name of Christ and getting baptized, that happened in March of 92. Once I learned, I knew what the Lord wanted me to do next. Because, like, when it was happening, I didn't know. I didn't know that, that I, I should make a public profession of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it was fascinating that I had been experiencing Jesus before I knew that's who it was. It's amazing. I still can't. Mentally, it's still. Uh, Intellectually, you can't comprehend all mm -hmm. of Yeah. It's a spiritual transaction. I love that. So what did it look like for your family as a unit moving forward now, like all all following Jesus, knowing Jesus, being engaged? Did it, did it change the dynamics of your life? Or was that like the same as with your faith? Was that just sort of developing and growing as you got to know Jesus and the Holy Spirit more and more? Well, the... We were very close because he's an only child and all of our all of our families in Virginia. And so we didn't have sitters. And that kind of, we thought we were always together, the three of us. Um, so that part was established. <laughs> Me as a father and a husband, and now knowing that I'm answering to Jesus, that it's no longer me making the decision of what's best or what behaviors are acceptable or not acceptable in the family. I'm taking my cues from Jesus. And so now, like church attendance and church service became a huge part. I'd say by 93 or 94, um, my wife and I were on all the committees. Wow. <laughs> it became that we're, hey, we got to stop saying yes to everything, you know. Um, but it, it definitely, the whole dimension of church uh, exploded in our family and the the great thing about writing songs for a living it's a daytime schedule and so i was available at night and schedule wise it's pretty predictable um because you're not traveling uh and i just went to nashville every day for 30 years um, yeah. and so and there's not uh you're not on a timetable 
And when you write songs for a living and you have a publisher, you have a quota. There'll be an annual quota. And most companies check that every six months. But whether you write two songs in a week or one or four, that's that's completely up to your creative schedule mm -hmm. as long as you hit those marks annually. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was an excellent uh, vocation yep. while he was equipping me and um, teaching me his work. That's awesome. Jesus said the time has come for me to go. Don't worry, I will not leave you alone. I'll send the Spirit, He will live in you. His holy touch will guide you in all truth. And he reminds me and He teaches me When I don't know what to pray He's never late with just the word I need. He reminds me this fallen world is not my home. Life will take some winding roads. But I never walk alone He reminds me So as Jesus is transforming you, how does that, if at all, how does that change or add to your creative process as a songwriter? It did change it. One thing was me identifying um, the source of the creativity. I always knew innately that I could hear melodies and do things musically that I couldn't take credit for. Mm -hmm. There was always a, a certain humility about that because I knew that I didn't, that I could just hear things. Uh, and, I, and lyrically, I would just, writing lines and having ideas just happened. And I always knew that that wasn't, that I wasn't the source. I knew that as a youngster. Um, now I'm understanding that it's coming from him. And so even though I kept writing secular songs for many more years while studying the Bible and eventually teaching hundreds of classes during in church at night, um, that faith started showing up in the songs more, with more and more frequency. And some of the other subjects uh, started not being written with more and more frequency. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the secularism of it became more um, family-oriented and middle-class-oriented, um, more so than parties and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so it definitely changed. Yeah. Did you receive any pushback when your label or the people that you were collaborating with saw or observed the slight shift in how you were writing? Uh I stopped getting invited to some functions. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fascinating, though, um, because earlier uh, how I said that I was dedicated to the craft, which kept me from some lifestyles, I was never uh, in some segments of the industry. Um, but as your faith is declared and seen mm -hmm. and witnessed, um, some people are less and less comfortable with it. But I noticed over the years, it's been long enough now that a lot of that played out. Um, some of those very people, I'm the one they called when, you know, they started having questions. Yeah. And so that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's true salt and light, whether you, you know, that you didn't plan. I love this. This is this is a slight tangent. It's just something I'm curious about um, because I know that in North America, um, 
Christian identity and nationalism and the idea of being a Christian um, is more, I would say, inherent than in Australia. Um, so I, my experience, at least when I've been to the States, is that it's more common for people to say, I am a Christian or because of this person went to church in my family or I go once or twice a year. Um, was there a difference, like, when people saw you were actively living out a Bible-believing, Jesus-following, acting Christian, as opposed to just giving a nod and mentioning maybe God in a song because it, it was sort of part of the identity of country music? Well, that's a very accurate observation, and uh, I love that thought process. Um, and it's changed. Uh, if we're talking about the 90s, the early 90s, when I was saved in 91, and then teaching 92 and 93 is where I began to be really, um, it was obvious that something had happened. Um, then I call it a secular Christian. Uh, secular Christianity and biblical Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, back then, in the 90s, there was less distinction of that uh, as far as people's perception of the two. In recent times, um, there's more division of people wanting to not claim Jesus, claim God, claim spirituality, but not, take, not claim Jesus. That's a big shift that's happened uh, lately in North America in the last 10 years, especially. Um, but there was definitely um, a difference. Some people would be at a bar getting drunk, claiming to be Christian. Uh, now, I'm not saying, I'm not judging behavior, but I'm saying that um, it depends on who you are and what responsibilities you have as to whether that's congruent. Or not. Um, but I think that your observation about North America is changing. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's changing for the better. I think that more people are, un are comfortable now saying, I'm not Christian, I don't believe in a creator. Mm -hmm. I think more North Americans are comfortable saying that now uh, than ever before. First, I'll get my ducks in a row. Clean up my act and I'll step on that straight and narrow road. The preacher said you can't save yourself, you gotta walk behind the Lord. He'll lead you to those streets of gold. What are you waiting for? We say one day, Sunday, first thing in the morning. But time slips away and won't take time to warn. Don't wake up on the sinking side of old Noah's door Look up, storm clouds are rolling in, what are you waiting for? Maybe over a decade ago now, you chose to start writing and creating and recording your own Christian music. Can you tell me what led to that decision? Yes, it's, it's another story. I can tell these things uh, without ego um, because I didn't do any of it. And so uh, the Lord did it at all. And uh, so I, I can tell it almost as a witness now, uh, I'm, I, as I'm witnessing it. And so uh, I had been writing, I had been under contract for 28 years. Um, about three years, uh, so, 2000, so 2010, um, I had been witnessing to my earthly father for decades, um, and he was stubborn. And he repented and received Jesus in an ICU unit in 2010. Wow. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, he had to get all the way to the end of himself, you know. And so he came out of that and he had a lot of recovery, but he was never completely healthy. Was it? And I got a call that he was going into hospice and that kind of thing to write country songs was expiring March 31st of 2013. 
I had all meetings and I had already had some meetings about renegotiating or whether I was going to do something different. So when I got this call, everything stopped and I went home to Virginia to be with him and to be with my mom. I encountered some things that were unexpected and he died February 22nd of 2013. And I stayed and helped my mother. Um, as I had said earlier in our talk, they were married 61 years and she married him when she was 15, he was 17. And so that's all she ever knew. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm one of five, um, I didn't feel like I could leave her. And so I was there for eight weeks. Well, when I was in Nashville, from early 90s to 2013, I was writing songs in the daytime, and I taught hundreds and hundreds of Bible classes at night at church, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And so uh, when I got this call, I went home, and when I was in Nashville teaching those classes, I never sung at church in Nashville, because if you if you're a known songwriter, and you have a Bible study class, everybody just brings you unfinished songs. You know, they want to just talk about songwriting. And so I didn't mix the two things. Well, when I went home and he died, my mother asked me to sing at my dad's funeral. Her pastor officiated the funeral. Well, then he kept asking me to sing at the church on Sunday. And I ended up being home eight weeks. And March 31st, my secular contract in Nashville was expiring. March 31st of 2013 was Easter. And he had asked me to sing at the sunrise service. And so I was singing in Mechanicsville, Virginia, where I was born and raised and where I had that initial dream of moving to Nashville. I was singing at an Easter sunrise service simultaneously with my Nashville publishing contract expiring. And the Lord told me that day that my season of writing country songs was over. Wow. And it was just an Ecclesiastes 3 kind of a moment of a time to tear, or time to sow, and time to plant, time to reap. And it wasn't a struggle. I didn't, I had, I'd been so deeply involved in the church and in the scripture and following Jesus. It wasn't him saying, we're going to do something different. I don't fight it. Um, but I had no idea what I was going to do. And so I was home a few more weeks after that. I got back to Nashville. I think it was the last week of April of 2013. And I started, you know, I was praying about, well, what are, you know, I know what I'm not doing, but what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, over the next several weeks, I felt compelled to make a Christian album. And I didn't know anything about marketing Christian products or all of the genres and all that. I just knew I'm going to make a Christian album. And I had written with Sonia Isaacs of the Isaacs like 20, 25 years before that. Um, and we remained friends. And her brother, Ben Isaacs, who sings bass and plays and sings in the, in the family uh, group, uh, he's an excellent producer. And so I called him and said, hey, you know, I'm wanting to make a Christian album. I'd like for you to do it with me. And I didn't know that he'd been uh, listening to my songs for years. And I didn't know that. That's yeah. awesome. And so, yeah. and so we made that first record. And going back to one of your earlier questions, I think there's there's maybe two songs on that album that are standards, like Working on the Build and, and Surely the Presence. The rest of them are my songs. And they were all written in that time period of me being a Christian but writing country songs. And so when I said that my faith kept showing up more and more, um, all of the songs on that first album, none of them were new. Um, they were all from previous writing. Um, and I didn't, I was working really hard, but I didn't do this. Um, the album got nominated for a Grammy. And so while I'm over here working and trying to figure exactly what is the Lord calling me to do, I knew I was supposed to make that record, but I didn't really know after that what was happening. And when it got nominated for a Grammy, which is miraculous, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in there with Bill Gaither and all these people, and it's just me, you know, what do you want to label? Uh, it's just phenomenal. Amazing. <laughs> and the, the 
so when churches started inviting me to come to their church and so that was 2014 by now that's when i realized what the ministry was it was me recording christian songs and having a ministry called the word and song and i teach the scripture i read scripture and the songs end up being kind of an application of the scripture or a parable of the scripture and but the reason i travel is god's word um because if it was just about music, well, that's here in Nashville, you know, I mean, all the music's here. Um, and so um, that transition was from the death of my early father. And I, I'm still fascinated by all through the scriptures, origins are very important to God. For some reason, he took me back to Mechanicsville, Virginia, where I was born and raised to change my call. And I still, you know, I don't, to the human mind, that could have happened here in Nashville. I could have, he could have called me while I was here. Um, but I'm still, I think there's some significance that I don't understand of my earthly father dying and me being in Mechanicsville, Virginia, when he changed my call. Mama had a Bible in her hand And I knew she was gone when I walked in I didn't have to wonder where she found the strength she had Mama had a Bible in her hand and Daddy had a smile in his eyes through tears he softly said this ain't goodbye He whispered we will meet again And I know that's the reason why My daddy had a smile in his eyes And I want to go like that when I go My cup running over like a river flows Surrounded by love when I'm crossing over, I want to go like that When I go It hasn't been easy um, as far as the making it all work, you know, because I, I volunteered for the church for 30 years. I didn't know how to have a ministry, um, and so that's been a learning curve. But that transition... Um, it just amazes me that he took me back to Virginia to do that. Um, and I still don't think I understand why, except that he loves to go back to origins. <laughs> I like that. That's beautiful. One thing that's been really clear to me as you've shared your story um, is that, see, I, at the start when I was talking to you, I said your impression, your resume is very impressive. Um, and there were things that were labelled, Grammy nominations, things that just leave me gobsmacked. And as I'm talking to you, um, there's a, it's, it's not even an air of humility. You're literally in all that God has done all this in your life. Um, and he clearly has, and I love that. But it stands for me in contrast to the route that is very uh, easy and nearly set to take in in Nashville but in in the music industry as a whole where you can get very set and obsessed with numbers and having to sell records in order to make money um to impress labels to impress fans um so it can get very easy to be consumed by ego um and it's as you're sharing your story with me it's very clear that your ego is is not involved in what you create you're just creating because God's called you to and you love him has that has that been an intentional process? Have you had to make that decision? Or has that really been, because God has been working so clearly in your life, has that route actually been set out by him? Well, thank you for saying that, first of all. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, going back to childhood and knowing that my musical ability, that I couldn't take credit for it, mm -hmm. um, that's where it began. So that there's been um, my whole life, uh, what he's allowed me to make a living doing, I know was given to me. Because yeah. um, I didn't sit around, I practiced, you know, uh, 
incessantly, but it was easy. Um, and if I heard something, um, I could go find the guitar and, and play it, you know. And I always knew that, you know, I can't have an ego about that because I didn't do it. Yeah. And even before I was Christian, there was a certain, I know now, and the, the, the Proverbs say, uh, the first of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Um, even then, I felt like if I had an ego about it or if I went around bragging about looking here at what I can do, I always felt like I could lose it. Yeah. Because it was given to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, then it became exponentially magnified when I became saved and then started being a disciple of Jesus in that um, not only can I not take credit for it, it's all grace. Um, it was paid forward. Mm -hmm. I'm just stepping into something that already that he'd already done. And so it's not really, it, it, it hasn't, it doesn't need a conscious decision to not be egotistical about that. The fact that he already did it um, is in and of itself, it humbles me. Um, and I know that, um, and so then when I go to interrelate with people, um, I've never wanted to act like, look at me. Um, and now I want to say, look at him. A lot of very creative people are very egotistical. I think that it has always been an obstacle to them being the best they could have been. Mm -hmm. Because there's a certain, it's like if you're writing a song and you know that the song is the most important part of this session, not me. Mm -hmm. Now you're serving the song. And if you're serving the song, you'll do what's best for the song. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has kept proven true oh, thousands of times. Uh, and so it's very comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a on my new album, there's a line. Uh, it's a, the song's about the Holy Spirit. And the second line, I mean, the first line of the second verse says, there's peace in knowing I'm not in control. And um, I'm not in that, I don't walk in that piece every minute of every day, but it's my goal. Yeah. You said the word and there was light. You spoke and stars lit up the sky. Your breath gives light. The waters part at your command Are come pouring down and flood and dry land When you say it's time You see every sparrow fall Hear every helpless sheep that's lost You're everywhere been praying, listening for so long, I feel all alone, God, if you're still there. Say something, say something. I'm down here on my knees Asking you to please Say something And what's your latest latest release? Called, well, it's called He Reminds Me It was released March 3rd Oh, brilliant! How did I miss yeah. that crucial fact? <laughs> Yeah, we got a long distance here. You, it might be coming over now as we speak. Um, there's a single off of there called On My Father's Side mm -hmm. that is uh, being played on Southern and Christian radio mm -hmm. here uh, yeah. at, at home now. But the album is March 3rd. Amazing. And what is significant about this album for you in 2023? There's many, many things. Um, that first album, 
as I said, were just songs I had written over years. When I look back, it was father-centric. There were many songs about the earthly father and the heavenly father. Then the second album, the one you just named, His Name is Jesus, is son-centric. And so now this one is He Reminds Me. It's out of John 14, 27, Jesus telling the disciples on the Thursday night before the Friday morning cross, I will send the counsel of the Holy Spirit. He will teach you of everything and remind you of all I have said. That's what that song is. So now this is Holy Spirit centric. Okay. So we have a trilogy, a trilogy of a trinity of albums. Um, and I didn't plan that. I didn't even realize it until I was in the middle of recording the third album that, hey, you know, this represents a trinity. <laughs> um, it's fascinating. Um, awesome. And so uh, this album, I would say, is the most informed by my going um, there's intentionality in this album um, that grew over the three. The first album, as I said, all the songs existed. The second album, there are two or three songs on there that were pretty new that I wrote thinking, I, I, I would like to have this subject, uh, you know, next time I come to this church. This album was completely um, formed with all of that in mind. Um, it wasn't like a, I didn't show anything that wasn't happening, um, but it was with more information, more uh, more background that this one was written and, and recorded. Uh, and uh, I'm just thrilled with it. I love that. Do you have a favorite track on the album, a favorite track today, knowing it could probably change every other day? Yeah, and it, uh, it depends on, you know, the, the single that's out on my father's side is one of my favorites because it captures, I think, in a way that I haven't heard, and I can say this as an observer almost now, uh, of the God man. Um, the whole song is on my father's side. And through the song, Jesus is saying on my mother's side, they, the, the Pharisees are asking him in the temple, how old are you? And where did you come from? And where did you learn these things? And he says, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old, born in Bethlehem. Uh, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. Uh, great I am. Uh, and the song does that through his life to the cross and the resurrection. I was listening to that track on the way here in my car, not realising it was the latest single. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, it has been such a joy and an honour to hear your story. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, if you could go back to the day before you moved to Nashville, Tennessee, all those years ago, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now? That's an interesting question because um, I've always seen it unfolding providentially. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think I would tell myself to uh, see failure as part of the plan and to get to Ju Jesus sooner than later. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. Perfect. When I look back, it's kind of difficult to argue with the timeline. Yeah. But but we don't. We never know. I mean, if we know uh, Romans eight twenty eight, uh, he works all things for good for those who love him and call according to purpose. So I don't know if he called me earlier and I missed it. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's always really something I wonder about. Yeah. Um, but um, looking back, um, um, it seems to make a lot of sense from this perspective, but. I know that he's making good of what I messed up. And so, yeah. you know, I would have liked to have been less affected by career failure um, because um, I'm thankful for that resume. Uh, but what, what's not in the resume is how many failures there were. Yeah. Um, and so. In my thinking, that failures uh, had a made what made wounds, um, yeah. and I see now that as part of learning um, 
that it's one of the best educational tools we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know that. So I would have yeah. told myself that, you know, before getting on the interstate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to remember that for myself too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a, a perfectionist, and so I, my standards are so high, so it's good to remember that, 100%. And the thing is, um, some of the lessons that then inform success mm -hmm. can only be learned from failure. Yeah. Um, so you can't see. It's like in Nashville, some of the first people you meet that want to partner with you if they see that you have ability are not people that you want to partner with. Um, they kind of have an eye for the lambs. You know? yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, but having chartered those courses prepare you for the real sharks that come later. Uh, it's when there starts to be real success. Um, then there are also people that want to trick you out of it. Yeah. Um, and so learning in the beginning that everyone doesn't have your best interest at heart, uh, it's better to learn that when the chips are small. courts were crowded from the feast I sat there surrounded by all the Pharisees they said who did you study under son how old are you are you here alone tell us where you're from well, on my mother's side, I just turned 12 years old, born just down the road, down in Bethlehem. But on my father's side, I'm older than time, I am the light from up on high. Perfect lamb, the great I am on my father's side. All right, that was Tim Menzies. Such an honor to have him on the show. Thank you, Tim, for your time. Now, everyone, his album, He Reminds Me, is out March 3. All the tracks you heard today are from that album, so you want to go pre-order it. And the last track on my father's side is actually the single, and that made it onto Spotify's Top Christian Playlist, which is awesome. So congratulations, Tim. Now, meanwhile, you can connect with Tim on Facebook at Tim Menzies Official. You'll also find him at timmenzies.com. All the links to his ministry uh, and details about his life are also there. I believe he may also be going on a trip to Israel later this year that it looks like people are invited to. So definitely check that out if it interests you. That was a fun exploration into the roots country genre, right? It's a like huge learning curve for me. I know so little about mi Middle America and what Christianity looks like in Middle America. Yes, I've spent time in Nashville, but apart from that, it's like L.A. and Boston. And I mean, I spent a little bit of time in Minnesota, but not a whole ton of time. So, so really, this has been a learning curve for me. And hearing how Tim talks about the importance of the Word of God, um, how it's taught in churches, was really opening for me and really encouraging as well. Remind me to always return back to the core of of Christianity, of who God is, of who God has shown us to be through his word. Um, that was really cool. So thank you, Tim, for taking the time, even post our conversation, to actually chat, to ask me about my life, ask me about what it looks like to be a Christian in Australia and what that means, things like that. Um, that was a real honour. Now, before we finish off, it is worth giving a tip of the hat to the news that has been all over social media this past week uh, about the series of Christian revivals 
that are happening around the country um, and apparently in other areas too. This, as far as I'm aware, started at Asbury College um, where a bunch of students and sort of staff started having a worship service and the Spirit of God fell so thickly. It just kept going. It's been going for days and days and days. Uh, when you hear this, it may or may not still be going. I can't tell you, but there's a, probably a good chance that at least one of these revivals is still going. They've broken out across the country. Um, last I heard, there was one in LA and the star of High School Musical, the musical, the series, gave his heart to Jesus and then decided to hold a rally the next night. Um, this is all really exciting stuff, right? Uh, but what's been really fascinating is seeing how Christians and the global church responds to this on social media uh, because, one, it's fascinating because this is the type of revival, like the type of revival that we imagine that we have prayed for for generations, essentially. Um, it's a type of stuff that as a teenager I go to rallies and be like, yeah, this is what we're here for. Uh, so it's fascinating that when it happens, we respond, we get really excited or we get really cynical, um, which I understand. Because at this point, if we are cynical or hold even like this sense of questioning, it comes from a place of unknowing because so many of us have been where those kids are now right? Um, whether we experience like a revival like they have or we had an encounter with Jesus at a meeting or a conference or we were so on fire for a long time. And now for some of us, some people have walked away from faith. For others of us, it looks different. Other people still carry that zest in everyday life, which is amazing. Um, I'm not one of those people, but go you. Um, that wasn't passive aggressive, by the way. It did sound that way, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, but all I wanted to say, purely from my perspective, uh, as a Christian, as a Christian journalist, um, is that, one, this is really exciting because these are, there's so many young people right now, particularly who are experiencing incredible moments with Jesus, like authentic moments with Jesus. This isn't, I don't think about music. This isn't about setting an atmosphere. This isn't about smoke machines. Um, those things can only sustain you for so long. I think what's going on is these people are experiencing Jesus. Uh, and, and honestly, when you've got a team of volunteers and church staff, you do everything you can, but you're only human. So you don't have steam to keep going. At the moment, they're relying on caffeine and the Holy Spirit and hopefully the rest of their wider church community to keep cultivating this, these spaces because this is the type of stuff that a church prays for and longs for and hopefully that God prepares you for, right? But um, when it happens, I can't imagine. I can't imagine like the behind the scenes work that's going into this right now as they're trying to steward this really well. So one, I'm so happy for these people, these people who are experiencing God, who are encountering God, whether they've known him before or this is new, how cool. And how cool that we get to witness this. Like this feels like it could be something that in a generation or two people talk about. We, talk, we, we hear about revivals happening that started movements or church denominations. Um, it feels like this could be, this could be something. Like we're in, we're, as people tell the history of the church and global Christianity in the 2020s and we talk about the pandemic and we talk about economic crisis but then we talk about this great spiritual awakening and that's pretty exciting that's just one thing the other thing was um that the fact that this is gen z it seems to be like people like teens and young people in their 20s predominantly not all but predominantly um doesn't surprise me because this is a generation that just longs for authenticity. They've been fed social media and what is fake their entire lives. And they're being drawn to an experience with a God who is above their understanding, who, is, who transcends the feelings and emotions and the chains that social media can put on us. They're experiencing a God who is bigger than COVID-19 um, and, and 
depression and isolation and suicide. They're experiencing a God who can overcome racism and prejudice, a God who sees each individual as sacred and made in his image. They're seeing a God who cares about the world and who wants it to reflect his beauty and his grace so that people can experience kingdom come before Jesus comes back. They want to bring some of that to earth and now they're experiencing a God who was giving them a language for that. We have a generation below us who want justice and beauty and want to create beauty and want to enact justice and now they're experiencing a God who will actually, who actually wants that, who actually says, come partner with me. That's been my mission since the beginning of time. Come partner with me to bring healing and justice and reconciliation in individuals and communities and in a world. Like, that's cool. It makes me excited that there's a group of young people who get to experience that and meet that Jesus. I think the name of Jesus has become so tainted. The name of God has become so tainted in so many ways. If you've grown up in the church and you've experienced religious trauma or you've even watched the news... <laughs> And you're like, oh, look, another pastor. Another pastor had sexual misconduct or abuse. Oh, look, there are those allegations. Oh, look, last week that church hired somebody who, who was said to have done that. There is so much to lose hope in when it comes to the church. There's hope too, but there's a lot. And if anyone's been in the church for any stint of time, you've held that and you've felt it and you've bared the brunt of it too. That type of stuff personally isn't going to convince me to follow Jesus. <laughs> the reason I follow Jesus is because I know Jesus. Um, and what I see these young people doing is experiencing Jesus, like knowing him without the trappings of power or ego or wealth. God's beyond that. And it's exciting to me that they're experiencing it. So... All that to say, where, where am I going with this? All that to say, two things. One, people, um, people have, been, have been cynical about this and some people questioning the validity of it, how long it will last. Um, look, these are all like concerns in my head too. They're not illegitimate. Um, and I think when people come out with cynicism, it can come from a place of your own pain or even come from a place where we're actually trying to guard the next generation because we've been taken advantage of in a really vulnerable place and we've experienced these moments only to be let down by our pastors or our preachers or a movement, right? So we can be cynical with good reason because we want truth and justice and we're concerned if these kids are getting it. We can't know the ins and outs of what's going on. I mean, even if you had knew the ins and outs of one of them, one of these revival movements happening at the moment, they seem to be happening everywhere. This is a local thing. This is God moving on a global scale um, and moving in cities and communities. It's not about a single person um, or a group of people. It's just God moving communities, right? In the uproar of going, I'm for and I'm against it, polarisation, I don't necessarily think we need to be polarised about this. I think we can hold it and say, what seems to be happening to these young people in these places seems real and authentic and beautiful and God is moving. And what is of God, as so many have said, like if it's God, he'll produce fruit and the fruit will be long lasting. Exactly what people have been saying on social media. It will. Awesome. And I think it's highly likely that we'll see that. I think it's beautiful. It's so hope filled. We need that. Um, and you know what, what isn't of God, it won't last. We know that. Um, but in the meantime, let's, let's just hold space for these young people and the fact that they are experiencing something profound and beautiful right now. For some of them, this is the beginning of their faith journey. For others, it's like a stepping stone in it. But let's really respect that. Respect that in this moment, this is sacred for them and it's holy for them. And we don't want to troll them or barrage them with hatred or scepticism or cynicism when they are so filled with joy. Let them have their joy. We had it. Let them have their joy. Life will happen. St tough stuff will come, but let them have their joy. They deserve it. God wants them to have that joy. Um, second, last point. There could be uh, a temptation in Christian circles, because we are so excited about this, a lot of us, to start making certain people pinups. 
So I'm talking influencers in Gen Z or celebrities in Gen Z who are converted or who lead these movements, who we then go, we love them. They're going to be on the front cover of the magazine or on the podcast. Yes, I said podcast. Um, or they're going to, I don't know, be at the next Dove Awards. They could have a career. Or look, they're in secular culture. They're going to take LA for Jesus. Like all of these things. We're, we have a tendency in Christian evangelical culture to try and Justin Bieberify everybody. Um, and what that means is that Justin Bieber and Justin Bieber's, like that's if he's going to be the avatar for it, have this pressure to be a perfect, mature Christian rest on their shoulders from the moment they say, I will choose to follow Jesus. And dang, that sounds hard. Yes, there's a sense of when people profess to be Christians in the public sphere, there's a sense of going accountability to the extent that, well, does that actually, are you saying that God agrees with this? There's a, there's a gray area there, honestly. Um, but while these people are so young, while they are so young, while they are so vulnerable, even the ones with wealth and power and prestige and acting cred, right? Even those ones, they are in a vulnerable spot spiritually. Let's not expect them to be a pastor straight away. Let's not expect them to be the next great Christian influencer straight away. Let's not expect them to be perfect or like a Christian musician instead of who they are. Let's let them be them. Um, their journeys in faith may play out in front of us purely because of the nature of social media and they may choose that. We don't have control over it. And so there's always room for discussion there. And that can be awkward, but let's have some grace on these people. Yeah, they have influence, 100%, but let's not monopolise their journey of Jesus for our own power and credibility. Jesus doesn't need that. Jesus doesn't need influencers or celebrities to make his name great. He already is great. Um, so if people are experiencing him as individuals and they already have some notoriety, then that's about them. And, if, you know, God will use them because God's God. But it's not about us using them. They're not commodities. God's already in the work business of transforming people and saving the world. He doesn't need us to take over everything. He's already at work. He's just, we're just seeing some of it like spring up. We're seeing some of the spiritual fruit we've been praying for for years. Um, so let's let these people be people. Let's let them have their joy. Let's let them take their journey and hope and pray that they are like plugged in to people who will like legitimately do life with them, with community who are like not, uh, who are not awed by them, with community who will just walk through it, do the deep work, build the faith, build the roots, like do all the things that it requires to follow Jesus in everyday life, no matter who you are or what your status is. That's a heart check thing for me too, because I always get so excited about quote unquote Christian celebrities. You should have seen me when I was a kid. Like I heard someone went to church and I was like, oh my gosh, I'll see them in heaven. Yeah, but you know what? Awesome. Let's let them just be them. Transformation doesn't happen overnight. Even the disciples had a long time. And I mean, even when Jesus died, they ran and they had a good few years with Jesus seeing everything. So there's grace. Let's have some grace. We can have just good discussion, robust discussion, but let's have some grace. Let's also keep our eyes open to see if anyone or anything of power tries to like leech on to this stuff. I haven't seen it at this point, but it's very easy for a Christian influencer or a celebrity or something to, to jump on board with this purely for the sake of power. Now, there'll be some people who like legitimately want to get behind it. And I think that's awesome because um, these people, less stories deserve to be heard because some of them will have influence that I can never understand. And so they'll need people of some prestige and genuine faith to walk alongside them, like other quote unquote celebrity Christians. They'll need that in their personal lives, 100%. Um, but let's just keep our eyes open because it's so easy for this type of stuff to be commercialized and commodified. Uh, and we can't necessarily stop that, but we can choose to not buy into it. And that's where it's really good that we ask questions. So let's keep our eyes open, our ears open, but let's keep our hearts open too. I'm excited for these young people. I'm excited for what God will do through this. And after that soapbox moment, thank you for joining me while I talked that out. I want to say thank you for joining me for another episode. What fun and what a privilege. I say that every time. I need to come up with a new word. Taking suggestions. Uh, would you DM me at between you and me pod? 
in the meantime, you can also find us on the web at betweenyouandmepod.com. Find old episodes, all sorts of fun stuff on there. It'd be great. All right, now that is all for this episode. Make sure that you have subscribed to our podcast feed so as soon as the next episode drops, you get it straight away. My name is Jessica Morris. Here's to hope. I've been wandering through the desert Ain't seen a cloud in forever over me But I believe your rain is coming You're the one who's making dry bones come to life You're the light I put my trust in Every word you say is gonna come to you And lead me to the promised land Everything you say is gonna happen Even though I haven't seen it yet I will build a boat in the sand Where they say it never rains I will stand up in faith I'll do anything it takes with you So long.